So he was like the main area leader um, for the gangs and um, that's what basically <laughs> made him to, for his demise basically. Nama Leon Edwards pada mulanya adalah petarung UFC yang paling diremehkan di Octagon. Namanya tak pernah dijagokan, apalagi dielulukan oleh penggemar olahraga tarung bebas. Tapi sejarah mencatat Leon Edwards bertarung layaknya singa pemburu kepala. 11 kali pertarungan, hampir 75% dimenangkan dengan knockout akibat pukulan maupun tendangan ke arah kepala. Itulah keahlian Leon Edwards, pemburu kepala yang paling diremehkan. Leon Edwards lahir di Kingston, ibu kota Jamaika. Ia lahir di kalangan preman dan ayahnya salah satu pemimpin preman jalanan Kingston. Sebelumnya, Leon bersama keluarganya tinggal di Kingston, Jamaika. Hanya dengan gubu kayu, satu kamar yang beratapkan seng adalah satu-satunya pelindung mereka. Kingston bisa dibilang sebagai zona perang, pasalnya di kota itu erat dengan kehidupan geng dan kekerasan senjata. Baku tembak pun bukan hal yang baru di tempat itu. Jadi, ia tak jarang mendengar desingan peluru kalau bermain dengan teman sejawatnya. When I was born, there was like wooden walls, zinc roof, and in that one shed, like shack, that's, that was your living room, your bathroom, your kitchen, your down, everything is in that one shack, right? But like I said, it was pretty normal for, I didn't see it as no other way, apart from TV. Um, so it was hard, but like I said, I had, I had great parents that always gave me the best that what, what they could give me. And um, I was fortunate enough to be able to come to the UK and to, make a better life for myself and my mum did and my dad did, you know what I mean? So, um, it was hard, but I learned a lot of great lessons from hardship and this is what I take it to my fight career. So, like I said, I believe it happened for a reason. Maybe if I didn't come from that, maybe I wouldn't have been, been as good as a fighter, you know what I mean, mentally. So, it's all for a reason and I believe that's my, that's my reason. Um, so, he was like one of the main like gang leaders in my area and, Okay, he was like the only one that afford to came to the UK and to start is did what he did, which is that not proud of it, but illegal stuff and to be able to send money money back to the community where we came from and so he was like the main area leader um, for the gangs and um, that's what basically <laughs> made him to for his demise basically um, when when he got killed when I was 13 years old in London and. Um, But yeah, he was like I said, he was a great guy and he did what he needed to do to to provide for me and my mom and my family, you know what I mean? And like coming from hardship, I understand the mentality that you do whatever you you, you have to do for your family. And I care what you have to do, you have to provide for your family and that's the only way you knew, you know what I mean? And that's what he chose to do and that's what he did. In Jamaica it was, it was a lot, like like I said, Looking back now, it's like not, it's like weird, right? Because like I normalized it as a kid, but it's not normal for a kid to grow up in that environment, right? But it's like it was pretty normal. Um, gunshots, killings, like come to a stage in Jamaica at one point when you hear, when you hear gunshots as a kid, you don't run no more. You know what I mean, it's like you you like you go be on a wall or something and then just carry on play on your bike. You know what I mean? It's like a normal um, just staying alive basically in, in, back then in Jamaica. Um, just came normalized killing death became no, normalized to me and um, at the age of like 10 I could name at least 15 20 people that's been killed that I've known <laughs> you know what I mean but it's like oh is it, it dead oh it's carrying the day like it's like a weird like looking back now it's weird like to imagine my son now being like that I couldn't imagine him being like that but that's the way we that's where I came from and that's my background and That's just where I was born, so I had no trust over it and that's it.
Liyun yang baru berusia 9 tahun ditinggal ayahnya pergi ke London, Inggris. Sang ayah kemudian mengajak keluarganya untuk pindah ke Anson, Birmingham. Liyun awalnya enggan untuk pindah karena ia harus meninggalkan teman-temannya. Akan tetapi takdir berkata lain. Ia yang datang dengan status imigran pun tak jarang jadi korban bulian dan ia selalu bersedia untuk adu jotos karena hal itu. Dan dari sinilah julukan Rocky datang. Situasi di Birmingham dan Kingston tak jauh berbeda, zona perang yang sama. Kala itu, Birmingham juga kental dengan kekerasan geng. Leon yang saat itu sudah berusia 13 tahun, kala ia mendengar kematian ayahnya. Sang ayah ditikam di sebuah klub malam karena urusan uang. Hingga kini, ia tak tahu pasti kronologi dan sebab kematian ayahnya. Ia pun masuk ke dalam kehidupan itu, menjual narkoba, merampok, menembak, menusuk adalah makanan sehari-harinya. Ibunya tak jarang harus ke kantor polisi untuk mengeluarkannya. Um, I was like 13 years old when I want to find out. I was, I was sleeping in bed and I was in my uh, mom. And then uh, like we both were in the same room. Like me and my brother and mom were all sleeping in the same room in the same bed and. I just remember she getting a phone call and she just started like, like crying. I was like, I was like keeping my eyes closed still. I just like crying, crying like, no, no, he's not dead, blah, blah, blah. Um, that's how I found out. I just kept my, I was like pretend like a, like I couldn't hear her basically. I was like kept my eyes shut, like pretend like, like I was still sleeping, but I could hear her like crying over the phone. And then that's how I found out. Yeah. For, for the processing, it's kind of like. Like I said, death becomes normal to me, like, at that age, right? Even just my dad, it was weird, because, like, I didn't even cry, you know what I mean? It's like a mad feeling. I, like, I, I didn't even cry. Even though I felt it, I just couldn't cry for some reason. I don't know what it was. And, um, and yeah, just, like, as time go on, just led me into the same path that he was going down, the wrong path, you know what I mean? And, like I said, I was a product of my environment. All my friends was heading down the wrong path, and I was in. The, so I was like following my friends down the wrong path, and um, yeah, just like I said, product of environment. Just keep heading down the wrong path until we get another another way out. And I'm happy that mixed, mixed martial arts gave me that way out. Um, especially in Birmingham back in the days, is um a big gang culture like Johnsons and Burger Bars, and those are like the two main gangs in Birmingham back in the days. And the school I went to was in like the in Aston, which is like the Johnsons area. And, so you have to see a fight or flight, right? Because on the way home from school, you have to see if you're going to fight or you can get robbed daily, you can get bullied daily. And um, like the first year of school, someone got stabbed in my school. You know what I mean? That's the like kind of school I went to. And um, so yeah, it, it, you can't do it just to survive, right? It's like a survival tactic. You use it so you don't get picked on every day and so you don't get bullied every day. Just just add something from there. You just start hanging around more with your friends on the street and doing silly stuff and. Just keep growing from there. Especially like doing what I was doing, I knew that my mom wasn't very happy with it. You know what I mean? And but I just couldn't see it like another way out because everyone around me is doing the same thing. And you got to think like a, I come from like a like a family. Like all my family is like a, no one's millionaires in my family. You know what I mean? No, I probably made the most money for like generations in my family. Like anyone in my family, I probably made the, made the most money. You know what I mean? And um. Because you got to think from a kid, if you get taught just like crying pays from a kid, you, you, you idolize like the drug dealers in the area, you idolize people that like in gang cultures, because that's all you know, right? So you're always around that, and that's, that's the only way I knew how to do it, is to go down that path. Even though I didn't want to go down that path, but I just didn't know another way how to do it. And um, So yeah, but as far as pressure goes, I don't really put much pressure on myself for that. I, I do my best. and. I would trust God to, to, to handle the rest and that's all I can do, just do my best and I think once I put pressure, too much pressure on yourself, you start like, breaking that mentally, you know what I mean? I just do the best I can and that's it. Saat berusia 17 tahun, Leon melihat sebuah gym di atas toko DVD kalau ia sedang berjalan ke halte bus bersama ibunya. Ia pun bergabung tanpa tahu apa itu MMA karena ia belum pernah dengar sebelumnya. Setelah menghadiri beberapa kelas, Lian berhasil meraih penghargaan dan prestasi. Ia ingat membawa pulang piala ke rumah dan disambut dengan senyuman ibunya. Barulah di usia 18 tahun, Lian melakukan debut amatirnya. 
Ia meraih dua kemenangan dari tiga pertarungan Hingga lima tahun berserang, ia akhirnya bergabung dengan UFC Kisah Leon Edwards pertarung UFC yang dimasukkan ke dalam MMA oleh ibunya dan berada di puncak untuk mengukuhkan warisannya Leon Edwards tidak pernah membayangkan akan bertarung untuk memperebutkan gelar UFC saat ibunya memasukkannya ke dalam seni bela diri campuran dalam upaya putus asa untuk mengeluarkannya dari jalanan Birmingham Edwards menjadi petarung Inggris pertama yang menantang sabuk emar UFC sejak Darren Till gagal merebut gelar juara kelas welter. Ia berhasil membalas dendam dengan sebuah tendangan ke arah kepala yang mengejutkan di UFC 278. And then one day I was walking past um, on High Street. And I thought like build like a gym um called UTC at the time and um, I was walking past she was like oh, she give it a go. I was like, uh, yeah, <laughs> like, I was like, yeah, yeah, I, I'll, I'll get just like keep like keep her happy, right? Yeah. She wants you off the street. Yeah, exactly. She wants to like keep me away from my friends. So I was like, okay, cool, I'll give it a go. And um, so went up, so went up the stairs, and I said, how much, how much was it? A month? And it said sixty pound a month. That's a lot for a gym back then, even now, you know what I mean? And but like, I knew she couldn't, she couldn't afford sixty quid a month to pay for gym membership, you know what I mean? So I was like, nah, I'm alright, I'm good, I, 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 don't, I don't want to do it. I was like playing it down, but I was like, nah, 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 you can do it. memang selama ini dikenal sebagai petarung yang tidak terhitung dalam jajaran petarung top meskipun dia sudah pernah memenangi 10 pertarungan beruntun kini Rocky kembali dengan saat yang tepat untuk menumbangkan lawannya Colby Ovington di UFC 296 kita tahu bahwa petarung asal Inggris ini memiliki senjata lengkap untuk menumbangkan lawan-lawannya Edwards mendapatkan julukan si pemburu kepala. Hampir semua pertandingannya dimenangkan setelah Leon berhasil memukul KO penantangnya. Tangan dan kaki Leon seperti punya mata yang mengarah kepada kepala. Leon Edwards mengaku MMA telah mengubah dirinya serta kehidupannya. Pasalnya, ia mungkin saja berada dalam penjara atau berakhir seperti ayahnya jika tak menjadi atlet adil pukulan di UFC. Nah guys, gimana pun dapat kalian semuanya tentang petarung yang satu ini dilahirkan di Jamaika di gubuk kayu dengan hanya ada satu ruangan, sekarang menjadi headline petarung bayar bertayang. Tinggalkan komentar di bawah, like video ini, and see you next time.